So yeah, my name is Rob. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Whitewell Analytics. We're a machine learning and AI company. And uh, the reason I'm here today is to talk about just a few things. Uh, first one being, you know, as an AI company, what are some of our core principles and operational beliefs that we stick to that I think we attribute some of the success we've had to? Um, you know, what, what is Whitewell? Um, what's the story there? Uh, what's our vision? Where are we going? What are we trying to build? And then, uh, you know, some keys that I think that we found to, uh, for successful data analytics, just some simple sort of rules. And uh, leading off with, or finishing off, I should say, with some of the learnings I think we've had as uh, young you know, entrepreneurs building a company in a competitive market over three years. Um, so to start off, uh, my background's in uh, quantum mechanics, uh, so I'm a physicist. And that's actually where I met my uh, other co-founding partner, Peter, right over there. I want to go say hi to him after. Um, Peter and I were lab partners, so doing a lot of technical you know, analysis and finding that we had a good synergy to present our results. Um, and just really, you know, we found that there was this uh, common ambition between the, the two of us that we really wanted to solve things, and it was about really getting things done, understanding them that really, you know, made the day for us. And, you know, when we think about science, uh, science is about challenging, believing, and exploring our understanding of reality. And science is a passion. It's not just a means to an end. And I think we have to treat it accordingly if we want to be successful at it. It has to be the kind of thing where you're pushing to solve it um, in spite of you know, the deliverables ahead. You're doing it because you want to push it. And, and really what science is all about, especially in physics or chemistry, it's really about creating a model that can withstand deeper and deeper scrutiny. Scrutiny from yourself, scrutiny from your peers, and to the point where it's withstanding the deepest scrutiny. And I think one of the things that uh, Whitewell really does a good job with is that um, we're the most scientifically critical of everything we do. And what's nice about that is if you're the most critical on the work you do and you hold it up to the, your own gold standard, then you don't really have to worry about how critical everyone else is going to be if you're the most critical. And I just think that it's, it seems trivial, but it's very important uh, to keep the you know, sincerity behind the value in the work. Um, what is a startup company? And I tried to put it in one sentence. And so a startup company means that you're a company with less than, you know, you're in the bottom percentile of resources with all of your competitors. But the advantage that you have for you is that you have the most adaptive market capabilities. So the way that a startup company works is it's the only type of company in the world that's able to say, let's look at the market right now. Let's identify where the value is and let's adapt our offering accordingly. And that's the only advantage you really have as a startup company. And so what we do is we remain adaptive, we remain very critical of what we do, and uh, what we've done in the last few years is where it started off in health and wellness, um, <clears throat> we've had a, been fortunate enough to expand into a number of different spaces. So we're in health and wellness, we're in a lot of the private and public health clubs, doing things like looking at these old sort of antiquated databases, being able to you know, connect the data to it and then being able to give it to the frontline staff to optimize things like retention. Um, we also work in the energy space, so we do things in the you know, traditional, say, D space, conventional and unconventional gas. So that's things like productivity or production optimization, uh, predictive maintenance, logistic optimization. Uh, in aviation, we developed uh, machine learning algorithms that are used for proactive mass detection. So you imagine that you have an airplane turbine with 16 years of history on it. And what ends up happening is the way that all these different sensors are behaving inside the airplane turbine can tell you something about the, the angle of the pedal and the amount of uh, power uh, being drawn to the engine. Uh, when that thing goes off and the pedal goes down and the power is not going, you have an issue there. And so it's a similar philosophy, but using big data. Um, you know, we've had the opportunity to work in professional sports, doing things like line simulation, uh, game simulation, uh, being able to actually do things like draft picks and optimizing teams. Um, <clears throat> most recently, we've been down in New York City uh, working with banks. There's a lot of opportunity in the financial space for big data and analytics. And then, you know, last but not least is uh, the defense space. And I think defense is a, it's a special part or special focus for White Whale because ultimately at the end of the day, we maybe with the exception of health, the objective of data analytics is really to increase the bottom line to make things optimized. Um, so it's this one example where we get to work in something where, there's, where it's a bit different and it gives us an extra push where the, you know, the target function is safety and it's well-being. 
Um, what's our, so what's our vision? Um, after working in a bunch of different spaces, uh, one of the things we realize is that there's a lot of rework involved in data analytics. So every time you go to a new client, they have data, it's all you know, across different cross-functional lines in the organization. You have to unify all that data. Once you have that data, you know, now it's about what's the right model you build and what are you trying to predict? You get from there and it's, okay, now we have all that, what's the visualization we're gonna put on top of it? And so what we really realized that we wanted to build was an all-in-one, you know, we say it's the world's best all-in-one AI platform that simply and significantly augments uh, intelligent abilities for everyday users. To take anybody to sit down to a computer, have them speak to, like, speak to the computer like they would a person, and give them the ability to use all of this, these state-of-the-art uh, machine learning protocols um, in real time, securely, and scalably. And then, of course, you know, uh, a big part of this is taking the learning and cu always customizing the experience to the user. So that for every person that sits down and they interact with the platform, um, the platform mimics them more and more and it becomes more efficient for them to use and they enjoy using it more. Um, and just, I decided to throw up the, the uh, simplest example we have of this. So it's just a screenshot of a template. Um, but what you can imagine is, you know, you are in health and wellness and you don't want to know what your member retention is for the year. So you simply ask it. Um, it uses natural language processing to understand your sentence, understanding the context, the objective, maps that back to the data, and then it says, okay, I think I have all the data that you're talking about, but what I need to know is, you know, when you say this year, what's my retention, what year are you talking about? And are you talking about all, you know, the locations? Are you talking about a, a specific area? So to be able to take the most context it can and then clarify where it needs it, and then to automatically build that model, automatically build the dashboard and have it something that's shareable. So, you know, as soon as you ask this question, that dashboard is now real time, it updates, you can share with the rest of your organization. Um, and now about data analytics and sort of, what do I think are the three most critical things uh, for successful data analytics? Uh, the first one is, or the, overall, just don't overcomplicate it. So stick to the first principles. Always have a, you know, uh, an outlook where you're looking at things in understandable first principle terms. Where, um, for example, in terms of getting data. So we know we need to be able to get data, but right now, uh, technology is accelerating at you know, a tremendous pace and we're getting more uh, space. Space is becoming more available. Computationally, uh, we have more power. And on top of it too, software is, is being, you're able to do more with less. So the way that we think about the getting the data problem is we just say, well, we know that it's only a matter of time as technology moves on that we are gonna be able to collect this data very easily. So let's just make sure that what we're doing now is that when we collect it, we know why we're collecting it, we're collecting the right things, and let's set it up for success so that we're not gonna to have to go down and rebuild this again. Um, you know, in terms of key models, one of the things that I think about is imagine um, you, know, you have a data analytic uh, challenge. And say there's, you know, there's four databases, there's hundreds of variables in each database, we're talking about terabytes of data, and you're trying to predict uh, something. So if you were to look at the number of permutations, the number of ways you could set up a machine learning model utilizing all subsets of data, it's conceivably infinite, it's a huge number. There's no way to actually go through all the data, try every possible model with every single configuration of data. Let's say you know, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of combinations. Well, imagine you had a computer powerful enough to do that, and you did, and then all of a sudden you go through every single machine learning model that's possible. Well, at the end of it, you look at what each one did, and let's say you were to only look at the top like, of all the models that were made possible, and you looked at them based on their value to the client, to the, uh, to the customer, and then you know, computationally and how accurate they were. Well, the idea is, is that if you went through all of that, and you came back to it and said, well, here's the best seven out of all possible models, it's a lot more efficient just to have built those seven models to start. And that's what we try and say, and I think that it was alluded to in some of the earlier presentations where it's about thinking about how you're defining the problem and making sure that when you're uh, you know, building the solution, you're already hitting, cracking one of those top models right off the bat. You don't have to search for it, keep it focused. And then on top of that too, um, once we have these models, what you can imagine is we've taken this data, it automatically synthesizes, we do kind of things like this, like saying, well, you know, this variable is good with this model. We pre-configure all these tags uh, using the data so that the models can just be called. 
And then really it's about visualization after that. And what's interesting is people, um, you know, we see in three dimensions. And there's been a lot of studies on our brains. And uh, it turns out that we're really good at processing things in threes. So now when you think about this, and you think about how it pertains to visualization and dashboards, um, really, there's only a handful of ways of actually meaningfully showing uh, information back to the user in a usable format. So what we do is, you know, built on top of our auto-generating models and auto data, we then get to a point and we say, here's a handful of different ways of visualizing what you want. The user can then pick what they want, and then it moves on. And so that's really how we take this whole, um, all these protocols and we simplify them, we make them modular, piece at a time. Uh, these are what I think the most important packages are for machine learning or AI people. This is what you have to import. Uh, they're language agnostic, so you can pretty much use them with anything. And uh, the first one is, uh, Im you know, import human logic. And, it's, and why do I say that? Because human logic right now is orders of magnitude more advanced than any other package that's available. And it's really, that's the package we're trying to build. That's what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get computers to mimic our own intuition, our own logic. And so it's a very powerful tool that I think that a lot of times in data applications is not actually being used. We're thinking about what are all the different things that we have access to, all these different algorithms, which one do we put in which order? But at the end of the day, not using that logical flow um, can be detrimental. Uh, patience is another big one, especially in this kind of field where it is quite technical. Uh, some of the problems can be daunting both in their size and their complexity. And uh, you know, what we have written up here is Believing something is over effectively destroys, destroys our possibility of making it possible. And, and I think that's very much the case. There's a lot of th times where the only way to really persevere in a lot of the applications that we're building and a lot of the solutions in building a company is to have patience and to remain calm through all of it because you will get there and it, it just never makes sense to give up. Um, to objectivity, I think I've you know, spoken to do that with, with science, with quantum. But the idea is, is just always use a first principle approach where everybody can agree what's going on. If it makes logical sense, line by line, that's the only way to do it. And the best part about that is, is that when, when things you're using first principles, they're very, very easy to tell if you're doing something right or wrong. Um, and then finally, so some things that I think that I've learned if I had to put them in order of, of importance over the last three years, and I think the most important thing, regardless if it's a startup company or a or a very successful large company, is sticking to the vision. So the vision, what is a company? A company is really a vision that people agree on and they put it down on paper and they incorporate it. And the vision is the, is the sort of the timeless principles and philosophies that the company represents. It's the lofty imaginative future that you want to build. And that's really what you're agreeing to. So it has to be adaptable, but at the same time, it's the vision. And, and I think, you know, if the vision's right here and you find yourself over here, it's never a good thing. It doesn't matter. There's no context in running a company or in building one where you shouldn't be right where the vision is. And I can't tell you how many times I've made that mistake myself where 10% of the energy, 5% of my actual energy goes into building what, I st what we started to, the vision behind it, where I'm really I'm putting that 95% of my energy in a number of other things out of context that aren't pushing anything forward. So don't make the mistake of, uh, of, of separating yourself from the vision because the vision is where it's at. Um, team is everything. Uh, you know, if there's anyone in here that thinks that they can accomplish more or do more without the team, well, then they're wrong. <laughs> and that's just the truth. And, it's, it, and you know, we, it takes time to learn that, uh, but it is the truth. Team is everything. It doesn't mean that any team can do anything. You need the right team. And if I had to say, how do you make sure that you have the right team? That is finding people that believe in the vision. If you have people that believe in the vision and they want to pursue it, they want to build it, then your team naturally is working towards the same thing in an unspoken way. Everyone knows what they're doing. Find the people that you can trust, people that can challenge you, elevate you, um, and people that you, you know, like hanging out with, so people that you can build friendships with. That's how a good, good company is built. Um, in terms of uh, you know, technology right now, uh, the pace is accelerating, and every day we have new efficiencies offered to us, new tools to use, um, and the idea is, is how do we adapt to you know, self-actualize, to use all of these different tools available to us um, and not get overwhelmed by them. And I think that you know, just to, from what I've learned, it's really important to, to plan your day every day and just say, you know what, it doesn't have to be over ambitious because nothing feels worse than not hitting a goal you set. 
So if you say I'm going to do 40 things tomorrow and you do you know, 22, you're not going to feel good about it. Whereas if you said I'll do 20 things and you do 22, you'll feel a lot better and it's the same outcome. And so that's really the philosophy you want to get in. You, you have to strip away what's essential, what's critical for the company, what makes you feel good to work. And you know, put those things down so that they're achievable. You can keep raising the bar, but you'll feel better in doing it. And just plan your day. And plan your day in a way that works for you as a person. If you're not a morning person, it, you know, it doesn't mean that you can read a book and says, well, you should be. And that's how you're going to be successful. And you go change everything. It doesn't work that way. So just do it. Play to your strengths. And then you know, always learning from mistakes. Because especially as a, as a young company with, a, you know, I think, one of our most senior people for the longest time is 27 years old. Um, we're going to make mistakes. And the key is, is that that's obviously a good thing. And you want to make the small mistakes, learn from them, and that's what's really going to stop the big mistakes. So just always learn from them, grow from them. You know? uh, and then also, I think that this one's really important. Uh, it's always important to remain calm, right? Because if you think about it, any form of panic, panic never helps. And I think everyone, everyone knows that. Remaining calm is basically saying, I'm going to use my energy most efficiently. I'm going to clean the slate, and I'm going to take all my energy, and I'm going to be calm, and I'm going to focus on the things I'm supposed to focus on right now. Um, and not 10 million other things that are going to basically create all this entropy right, in your head. And it's going to make everything uncertain. Um, and then, of course, don't over-speculate. And what I mean by that is this could be more towards, well, I think it applies for all companies. But it's amazing how four things that were important today. And you knew that you know, the night leading into it. And then all of a sudden, through osmosis, through different information, maybe you read something on a sign, you overheard somebody. Now, all of a sudden, there's this fifth thing you're worrying about. And it came out of nowhere. It's like this phantom, you know, driven by all these, through osmosis, different things you're thinking about that become a concern. You start to take priority. And speculating about competitors, speculating about all kinds of things that can go wrong, those are enormously, uh, they waste your time. And, you know, the idea behind it, and I, and I really believe this, is that if you're focused on something that it's going to be a problem, you're probably going to turn it into one. And, and that's really what it's about. It's about always looking toward the solution towards the vision and don't start looking at things that could possibly get in the way. Obviously, you have to you know, be conscientious about different risks that are happening. But always, you know, if something's not a problem yet, don't focus on it like it's going to be. Because that can happen both on a technical level, on an operational level, on a political level. Right? Um, so I just think that it's really, really important to you know, remain calm. Just We only have so much time in the day. We only have so much energy. And so may as well do it in a way where you're enjoying your day in a way that makes sense for you. Um, where you can think clearly and where you're not wasting your brain power on things that are really trivial and that don't matter. Um, and, you know, sort of finishing thing off, and I think this, you know, I think here's a good time to really thank Drew and IBM um, for this next statement. But as, uh, you know, as being in with Whitewell for the last three years and really being fortunate to, to have some of the opportunities we've had and to work on some really cool things that I, I honestly would have never thought I would have been able to work on even one of them. Um, what we realize is that the marketplace has enormous potential right now. It has enormous potential right now. It's, it's one of the best markets in the world. You look at the way technology is it, it's enabling people to be more imaginative and to make more things happen, right? Because it's all this efficiency. It's software. And so the reason we know the marketplace has great opportunities is because we all have great potential. And we really are the marketplace. So you look at the, what IBM is doing, bring everybody together. You look at what Drew's doing. You know, when I met Drew, uh, uh, last year, um, I remember one of the things, you know, in talking to you, you said, you know, all I want to do is make awareness that the opportunity is real and it's there. And it really is. And I just think that it's a good place to land off, especially with IBM hosting us. And uh, there's a very bright future for what can be done with data analytics. And, uh, for all those interested, you know, I wish you all the best with it. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure we'll open up to questions later on. And don't be afraid to go approach Peter over there, too. Um, any questions you have about Whitewell? <laughs>